Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Welcome to the uh, Ask Me Anything from um, uh, broadcasting from Rotterdam and Dubai uh, today. The Ask Me Anything um, from Up Rotterdam. Um, excited to uh, to have you all here. Um, uh, Lisette is here in the room uh, uh, with me, with Jan Kees de Jager uh, dialing in from uh, uh, Dubai. We'll talk about in a, in a moment. Um, but for the participants out there, maybe to uh, explain the format to you uh, before we kick off is. Um, we've organized this Ask Me Anything uh, as an opportunity for you to learn from, uh, from your peers. Um, normally we run this offline, but today we'll do this uh, in the online webinar, um, which means you get to ask the questions that you want to ask. And we're really happy that we've seen quite a few questions uh, come in already. Uh, if you have additional questions, use the Q&A um, to uh, put them to the chat, and then Lizetta will uh, uh, filter out those questions and we'll ask them to, uh, um, to Young Case. Um, uh, please note that this session will be recorded. Um, uh, you will not see your own chat uh, uh, online, but we will be recording the session, so your questions might be registered. Um, that said, my name is Lars Kramer, the private lead for Op Rotterdam, but I'm really excited to have a special guest today, uh, Jan Kees de Jager. Well, I think everybody knows Jan Kees as his um, role as a former finance minister of the Netherlands, uh, as the CFO and a board member uh, of KPN, uh, or even as a chair of the economic board of South Holland. Um, but I think what not everybody knows, Jan Kees, uh, and that's why we're really happy to have you here, uh, is that you actually have quite an extensive um, uh, ex uh, career as an entrepreneur. Um, so today we'd really uh, like to uh, tap into your brain and experiences and stories a little bit uh, to share with the founders. So welcome, Jan Kees. Thanks for making the time. Um, maybe as a kickoff question, can you, can you start by explaining your journey um, uh, as an entrepreneur and, and kind of what your background is, what, uh, what brought you here today? Yeah, well, actually that already started at the age of eight uh, on a very young, uh, at a very, as a child. Uh, I started my very own super small, tiny company that um, bought vintage uh, toys from uh, children that were a few years older than me. And I sold it uh, to uh, children at, from my own age. Uh, today we would call that like uh, probably um, uh, kind of recycling uh, and uh, vintage uh, tools, but then it was just a secondhand business. Uh, but it earned me a 30% margin. It also mean that my working capital at that moment was always toys. So always I had the uh, possession of some uh, toys that I could utilize uh, almost for free. Uh, for a tiny cost of capital, which I, at that moment in time, I did not count in. And then I uh, started, when I was 12, uh, a photography company also, uh, which was also a big hobby of me, but I also learned how to monetize on, on that. And with the money of, of actually that, uh, that hobby, uh, that turned to also in a business, small business model, I started when I was a student in Rotterdam, my own... Uh, internet multimedia company at that time called ism ism e company and uh, well during the course of the years it grew further now with around 600 people worldwide with a lot of different uh, products and um, uh, establishments but the roots uh, are in rotterdam actually uh, the uh, the headquarters still at the vanilla factory but uh, most of our new business actually is based in other parts of the world, uh, other parts of Europe, but especially North America is our largest market. And Thank obviously you. also Asia Pacific will be also a big market as well. Wow. Okay. So actually, so you started off your career as actually one of the first entrepreneurs that made a 30% margin on a circular business uh, when you were a young kid. Uh, and I think yeah. Yeah, true. you're responsible, I think, for one of the greatest uh, tech companies here, I think in the Vanilla Fabric, right? Uh, um, uh, ISM and then with Sana Commerce and Easy Generate. And we'll probably get to that uh, in a moment as well, but that, because I think some of the questions are really on, uh, I think also on that internationalization and how do you go abroad? Um, thanks for that. So, I mean, do, running a uh, Ask Me Anything in this time uh, means we're also gonna be talking about the Corona and, and the, the crisis that we're in, right? So um, I'd, actually, I'd like to start with one of the questions that we received on kind of how people are dealing with this new reality. Um, and for instance, we received a question from, um, let's start with the question on team, on, on how you deal with talents. Um, we received a, a question and I'm just gonna go through it from Sana is, um, so I asked, during a crisis like the one we're in now, um, to what extent 
do you share bad news with your team? So to what level do you want to be transparent? Now, this is kind of a, a shift, but let, let's move to that space a little bit. Are there any experiences you have in your past on and how, how do you communicate about the crisis? Yeah, my, in my experience, people are very resilient, also in receiving bad news. And I think the, the one thing they would probably worry most about is that they don't hear the whole story or the whole truth. So in my very strong opinion, I believe you have to be very transparent, also about bad news, but at the same time confident that you are able to overcome it, or if you are confident, of, obviously, and I hope you are, but that you are also um, have a, in that message, perhaps a bad message and a message of bad news, also have some hope as well, convey also confidence to your people and tell them how you believe and you are convinced how to overcome the challenges that you are facing at that time and also include them in the uh, solution. If you do not do that, they will not be able to um, turn some of their agility uh, into a part of the solution as well. And if you mm -hmm. do that, if you make them part of the, uh, if you uh, transparent uh, uh, information, how your business actually is uh, running at that time, uh, then they will not be able to help you as much as they could. So yes, I, I strongly believe that you should be uh, transparent, but also convey a message of hope at the same time. Right. So be transparent, bring hope. And also, I think one uh, thing you, you mentioned is uh, including them in the solution. I think that's a really yeah, yeah forward looking uh, way to look at it. OK, great. Thank you. Um, we have a question from uh, Graciela, uh, and it's also kind of dealing on uh, dealing with the crisis uh, uh, now a bit. So she shifts it from talent more to kind of your uh, your partners, probably your clients. And she asks, so during times of crisis, how do we convince our potential partners to really move move forward or partner up so we limit uh, a delay in our business growth? So pretty much she's asking, you know, how do you make sure that your customers, um, you know, keep doing business with you in these uncertain times? Yeah, the biggest downturn in these crises, that's also what we have seen in the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, is actually not the, the, the first immediate crisis response to that crisis or the fallout of that crisis on the short term but it's the fallout on the midterm and that's also yeah. trust related so the most important part is if you want to 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 keep benefiting from your partner network to grow on your partner network is also to convey them a message that um is bringing them a added value on keeping doing business with you. So I think you should be make them part of your long-term and mid-term business model and understand that probably it's trust and can we invest now at this moment in time? Well, for me, I think this moment in time is a very good time to invest in the future, also okay. for your partner network, but you have to give them something that they can believe in and also that they will they, they believe it's a long-term relationship. So right. include them in your strategy. Say, well, this is the corona uh, crisis. This will be the, fo the economic fallout. We understand there will be also uh, economic uh, recession because of this, not only in the months that we have a lockdown or partial lockdowns, but also afterwards as a result of uh, secondary uh, macroeconomic um, results and fallout. But at the same time, in this uh, situation, we believe with our product that you are be able to sell it at a good margin and this and that is your benefit. So give them a, a business case okay. for them to believe in you and subscribe to the business case and give them all the confidence that you will be there for a midterm and a long-term uh, solution because that's what partners will be looking for now is long-term sustainability. Everybody right. is struggling in this crisis so long-term sustainability is extremely important. If you can present your partners with that perspective, with a long-term perspective, that they can earn money in the long term again with you, then I believe that there's less chance that they will churn away from you. Okay. And then, and then really practical, how, do you have any examples from your past on kind of 
uh, how do you make this practical? So you have the long-term business case, but then kind of how do you kind of get that foot in the door? Because I think, and I know Graciela a little bit, maybe it's also kind of how do I, you know, keep them practically engaged? So what will be even the step for that to, uh, yeah, to kind of make it, sure that they're still interested? It, it depends a lot on your, so I don't know the business of uh, Graciela, of course, but it depends and, and everybody has, uh, who's listening in also has a different type of business. It depends if you have services or a product related company. But for example, if you have some, uh, overcapacity at the moment that you can utilize. You could also partly utilize that uh, to um, present your partners a support or a free education in your products or services on how to implement it. So right. that comes at no immediate, immediately cost or cash out for you because you have that overcapacity anyway at this moment, but you demonstrate that you are willing to invest in the long-term relationship and you don't ask money for that uh so you don't you you wave a little bit of profit now but at the same time not at a huge cost out or cash out at the moment it, because you still have that overcapacity and invest together with that partner in this new relationship and he will remember you for that next year and in two and three years as well if you help them through this crisis because of supporting each other being solidary uh, to each other, yes, that will be remembered. Okay, nice. So building long, long-term uh, relationships. Um, okay, we I have a question from um, uh, Richard, um, and I, I know that Richard has a kind of a, a, a product uh, a company, but I think this makes sense for most people. He asked about um, the focus on R&D, product R&D. So his question is, as a scale up with a focus on product R&D, would you continue with your current roadmap and kind of spend valuable cash on, on this, knowing that sales are going down, uh, but knowing that the market will go up in the end, and can I, or would you just say, I'm gonna decrease R&D, I'm just gonna extend my runway, I'm gonna account for revenue decrease, and uh, et cetera. So what will be your, what is your experience on, on, that, uh, on that question? Okay. Yeah, so um, one of our, in, in my experience, one of our, at, at ISME company, one of our successful products, Sana Commerce, actually was established at the moment of a crisis. And it started mm -hmm. the after, in the aftermath of the dot-com crisis that we believed that we had a, an hourly built services model and at that time. And we believed that we wanted to first to be less crisis sensitive uh, because there's a lot of volatility, uh, of course, in, in these crises, especially IT services are extremely volatile, uh, consulting IT services, hourly built services. So we wanted to have a more um, stable revenue uh, plan, but also one which is more scalable. So rather than filing those people's our overcapacity, we utilized a lot of our overcapacity into uh, product development. So we actually stepped up our product development. Um, we had also at that point in time, the cash rate. That's, that's of course, I cannot, I, everybody is different in this way in, in his balance sheet. And, and it's, uh, so you have to check, of course, also that if you can um, afford it, but if you in any way can afford it or even raise some friendly capital um, uh, to do that, I think now it's the time to invest uh, in, in a product, but if you already have a product, maybe not making a completely different product, but invest more in that product because I also believe in focus. So normally I believe in, in focus, but having that said, uh, there's also something like never waste a good crisis. If you have a, uh, uh, if you see uh, capacity, uh, if you're able to step up R&D and more development in your product, more uh, resources, uh, oriented to your product, then you will be in, in like two years from now, you will be extremely happy because you have, if you have survived this and also again, always keep also a good eye on your cash flow situation because mm -hmm. companies normally uh, doesn't uh, become insolvent because of insolvency, but in because of cash, because of liquidity. Yeah. So you always, of course, keep every uh, day of the week an eye as an entrepreneur on your cash position. But having said that, if you have any means in stepping up product development, I will do it now. And then uh, you will um, reap the fruits of that for sure in, in, in like uh, two years time from now. When the market, the market will recover, the market will grow again. And then a product that is more scalable and perhaps in a, like in our case, not focused uh, to a single country, but in a product that is 
available for many more countries because the Netherlands is ultimately a very small country. It's only 2% or less than 2% of the world, world economy. And if you have a product that scales, uh, then you can also uh, you utilize the 98% of the, of the rest of the world. Yeah, that's, that's a fair point. And I'm, I'm actually happy that most of the uh, startups and scale ups that are in this, in this group all have, a, have found a scalable business model. Uh, okay, uh, that's good. To start that's with, that, uh, that helps, but still, I think they, uh, they can always go abroad uh, faster when they're ready. Yeah, so, so if you have already part. a product, then you are just invest yeah. maybe in, in a product that is very much related to it or yeah. make your current product even better. But I would yeah. say, keep investing in your products because that will, uh, mon that will be monetized in one or two years from now. Yeah, w which is interesting because I think a, a follow-up question from, uh, from Hans actually is, uh, and it relates a little bit on, I think your point on focus, he asked during a crisis, how much do you spend on kind of your pivoting your business? So kind of finding your new uh, solutions versus kind of keeping what you had before the crisis. And, and, and again, I think it's different for every organization, right? But how do you keep that? Uh, how, do, how do you organize that? How would you do you know, he, he, do he, does he also have a product or is he more a service? I think he's a service uh, business. This is a service, service business. Service business, yeah. yeah. So I think, well then, again, for services business, it can be completely different than for product uh, uh, companies. Um, I, I normally, I strongly believe in focus. But having said that, again, uh, if I would have kept focus, I would still uh, be selling uh, second-hand toys. And I would probably not be in Dubai now, partly running an international business. So uh, there's always something uh, um, uh, to say also about, uh, you have to be able also to be a agile and to be able to divert a little bit, but yeah. then also keep your path, set a point on the horizon and make sure that that uh, will happen. But keep agility at the same time in your course because the world changes. So also uh, your, your product needs and your market also changes. First of all, that starts with always understanding what your customer. I, 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 I talk a lot of, lot of um, times with uh, startups and scale-ups. And the interesting thing is that there's, although in many cases they are much more efficient than corporates, but strangely enough, many startups and scale-ups do not talk that much about the customer, whereas talk like corporates in the last 10 years because of all the crisis and revenue declines you have seen, they have also, they have actually reinvented themselves. And some of them now have become much more customer focused, extremely uh, customer centric. So I think um, uh, whilst I also see the inefficiencies of a corporate as well sometimes, I also th believe that in some respect we can learn from corporates. And one of them is, is some of the corporates have done that really right is extreme, being extreme customer centric. And um, so that starts what, um, what with understanding what your customer actually wants, not what he says he asks you. I see a lot of services company because they have an hourly built um, uh, model and they start building a product, they build what the customer says he wants. But as Henry Ford, the inventor of the mass produced uh, car always said, when I would have listened to my customers, I would have made faster horses because before the car, customers did not ask for a petrol uh, in, uh, in, internal combustion engine powered car. Um, so if they don't, they don't know the next generation product. So uh, you have to also be able to understand what you actually want, a means of fast, efficient, cheap transport. That's what Henry Ford saw. saw. So he replaced the horses with a car. And uh, that's also how you have to think about it. So st start with your customer, become a truly customer centric uh, company, and then understands what he wants and then develops your services or your product from there. So if that, if that means pivoting your uh, an kind of a new business or your existing business into something new, then yes, okay. But if it means, well, my current business is not doing that well because of this crisis. That's why I'm starting something new. I would rethink that because yeah. this crisis also will be overcome. Probably you in that market that you are also starting, there's other uh, competitors that have a way uh, more competitive advantage than, than you. So it depends. If you see an opportunity that you, do, that you see there's no much demand yet for, but there will be demand uh, uh, intrinsically, there will be demand. Yeah. And then it could be, 
a good opportunity to start a new uh, business, but otherwise keep focus and improve your existing business, uh, but also rethink about what your customer really wants and maybe fine tune and pivot on your existing model, a better version of yourself. Right, right, and keep listening to the customer. So, um, and I know that you're now, uh, I think one of the hats that you wear is the, the president of Easy Generator, right? So uh, yeah. I think that is, that is forward focused, that's outward focused on really making sure that you understand it. So how does it work for a company like Easy Generator? How do you get the, the, the kind of the customer needs uh, into uh, developing your next version of the proposition? Yeah. How does that work? Well, we, we, we try to remain there an extreme agile and actually small company in terms of uh, FTEs. We, we grow 86% uh, annually last year again. Also this year, until now, we have grown 80% even with the corona crisis. Actually, maybe also partly helped yeah. because of the corona crisis. It's an e-learning uh, authoring tool, Easy Generator. And um, we see markets, uh, the most development market for us is the United States, by far the largest market. Uh, so it depends also in, in per market. Some markets you have to develop more. Some markets are already mature and you, uh, your uh, go-to market model is different there. But we keep always a very close feedback uh, loop with our customers. So all individual customers have, uh, are asked in NPS, Net Promoter Score uh, surveys, what they believe, uh, feel about the product. NPS is probably a known uh, metric with a lot of SaaS companies, but also corporates actually, they, that's where it started. KPN, KLM, yeah. uh, always also use uh, NPS uh, figures as well. But also, so we use NPS, but also the feedback, individual feedback loop on what it feels that is missing in the product and what could be done better. Hmm. And also, and some of our customers are very intelligent about it because then they ask 50 things extra and then they say but the one thing that is generated is generated really shines about compared also to the big ones like adobe uh, captivate is the easy part so the most important thing do what is possible in adding extra functionality but if that is not possible in keeping it easy to author then don't do it and yeah. so we have a constant feedback in our, in our uh, software. There's a constant feedback tool also for all the, it's a SaaS uh, tool, so it's very scalable, but also the feedback is very scalable. Customer success is always evaluating that. And, uh, and then also the relationship between customer success and product development is very short. Uh, and that's also why uh, the only thing that as a president, and it's a part-time job, we also, we also have a CEO, the only thing as a president I directly steer, also myself, is actually product development. Because not, it's not only a personal interest of me, but for a SaaS company, that is truly where you shine and where you yeah. have to incorporate the future. So we keep investing. Also now, we actually, we just uh, started a second uh, development team in Sri Lanka, only a few hours here from, uh, from Dubai. Our other uh, development team is in, uh, in Ukraine. And... Um, uh, so we, we are really now scaling up also product development because you have to uh, keep investing in that, but it's always on the basis of customer feedback tools. But again, yeah. you also need a vision on where to bring your customers in the next few years. And our, our CEO is a visionary on e-learning software. So also talk a lot with him because he has different opinions, different thoughts that customers not already convey to you. So right. you also have to think, okay, but this is what the customer wants, but this is how we are going to lead the customer in that new way. And that's right. a combination of vision and doing what the customer wants. But that's, that's, that's two things that you have to intelligently combine. Right. So, oh, okay. So listening to the customer, but really understanding what the deep desire of the customer is, maybe not the, the first yeah. answer. Well, and, and maybe, and, and I know that actually, uh, I think your uh, answers are so insightful. So thanks also for the people in the chat kind of uh, thanking you for that. Um, I'm, af I'm afraid we cannot answer all the questions, but I think one question that uh, kind of feeds into this on dealing with customers is um, the question of, um, where is it? Dealing with, ah, dealing with a corporate customer. So um, you obviously you were the CFO of uh, KPN um, and I'm just looking at a question here. Where was it? Um, um, I just read it, but I, I lost it here in the chat. Um, oh, there you go. At least that is so nice. All right. So um, I forgot who it is. Asked. I think it was uh, uh, Paul. Uh, if you are a startup with an innovative software solution, in your perspective, 
what is the best way to approach and build a partnership with a large corporate such as KPN? Um, so pretty much, how do you organize for corporate startup collaboration or kind of, you know, partnering up with a large corporate? How do you organize it as a startup? Yeah, well, I, th this was one of my frustrations as a uh, tech entrepreneur many, many years ago when we dealt actually also with KPN in, the, in building the chipper software, the chipper loyalty software that was one of the the first uh, kind of payment and loyalty com combined cards on a on a payment uh, system. Ultimately, it 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 it, it failed. Like all the chipper based uh, payments um, products failed in the Netherlands. But um, we built uh, actually quite I think a good loyalty loyalty system for that. But it was a real pain in the ass to engage with a corporate uh, customer. And that's that experience. And maybe is one of the part is is part of the reason why I said yes to become a board member and a CFO at one of those corporates, actually one of those that I had previously dealt with, and try to um, change it. That was also my, um, to the board of supervisors and the CEO, I said, I don't have much conditions, um, but uh, I really want to start up also a venturing fund, venture capital fund, and engage a completely different way with startups as well. Later, I also started uh, together with Nelly Cruz Costa, corporate startup initiative, to help uh, better in bringing together the completely different worlds of corporates and uh, startups. So uh, there's actually there's a lot of ways now on, on a lot of things improved, and still it's it it remains ex to be honest extremely complex to engage with a, with a corporate. Having said that, there's something as I said also improved, and start with perhaps. Going to one of the uh, the meetings, like KPN hosts uh, in Rotterdam, actually most of the time in Rotterdam, sometimes in Eindhoven or Amsterdam, but most of the times in Rotterdam, they host still uh, something that I started together with the um, uh, the new business team, uh, the um, uh, startup uh, evenings, and there's a lot of corporates there, there's a lot of uh, capital, venture capital, private equity there, and most of the uh, participants are also startups and scalers. And so it's a good place to start networking when that's possible again in the Netherlands to be to, to physically uh, network. But also um, just pick up the phone or email. Uh, for example, if you want to address KPN, Marie Jose van der Boomgaard, she's the yeah. liaison officer. And in Costa, all the corporates that were uh, that pledged to, corpora, uh, to Costa had to pledge that they would establish the same kind of person, liaison startup officer. So the, many of them have done that. You can find them also on the Costa website of VNO and CV. And just, I know those persons are much more easy to access uh, the, uh, the corporate than try to start directly with the CEO, CFO, or CEO. Right. Just use them as a bridge uh, to the business. Also, um, know what a corporate keeps uh, them tick. What makes a corporate tick is, is of course, uh, opportunity, but also cost. Uh, so if you have a thought how to engage with the co uh, corporate, in many cases I've seen that I was engaged, there was no clear idea, no clear business case, what that person actually presented to me. So, and then but you don't have much time as a, as a corporate executive, and then you, well, you, it's very easy to reject it because, well, you're not, you're not going to help build that business case because you have like dozens of those uh, suggestions each day. So do, a, and you also have not much time to read. I also get sometimes like 10 pages of a business case, 20 pages. Yeah. That's, that's just a few lines that helps them either in their top line, increase revenue, or improve their bottom line in lowering their cost. And very ah. specifically, how you are able to do that, how also to build a future relation. Of course, it can be good for you as well, and you can also be transparent. Of course, they know it. It's, 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 it has to be good for you as well, but also make sure that they believe what it what is in for them, and if be very concrete. And then the I also already mentioned the venture capital uh, funds. Some, not many, but some of uh, them have. Almost all venture capital funds that we have, all VC investments that we did at KPM, we also helped them to build a positive relationship as a customer also with KPM. So if you are 
if you have some investment of the corporate venture funds, then for sure it will help to be introduced to the business and actually engage in the business because you skip a lot of red tape already when you have entered into a relationship through the corporate uh, venturing fund as well. So yeah. that is some, well, some uh, practical uh, advices on how to uh, approach it. It's, and also have a lot of patience as well. Patience, it takes a little bit of time. Uh, no, but I think you, you mentioned something uh, really concrete, right? So make sure you really share how you're contributing to the, to the revenue growth or how you're gonna s help save costs. I think that's what you sometimes forget when we introduce our solutions yeah. to, to anyone, uh, not only to corporates. Uh, and we'll put the Costa link uh, down in the, in the notes. So thank you for that. Young case, we're, I think we could do this for hours, um, but unfortunately we are running out of time. So um, thanks to everybody for sending in their, their questions. Uh, sorry, we could not answer all of them, but at least I hope uh, most of them are for you. Um, maybe young case, before we uh, kind of close off, um, we know that you're now uh, in, in Dubai, although your background says, says that you're in New York. Um, so maybe as a final question to you, what is it that you know about Dubai that we, that we don't know? What brings you to Dubai? Well, I always wanted to leave the Netherlands to uh, pursue an international entrepreneurial career. And actually, up to a few years, up to like eight years ago, so I think, actually, that would have been uh, New York. I started also business in New York, so our commerce is in New York. Uh, yeah. East Generator is, uh, US is the biggest market. And, but, but my KPN, but also uh, my, my time as minister, finance minister, but especially my KPN time, um, convinced me that the future 20 years of growth is not in the West, but will be in the Middle East and Asia Pacific East. So the MENA, Middle East, North Africa region, and Asia Pacific regions for the next decade, next two decades, will be by far the fastest growing regions in the world with huge markets as well. The, obviously, that what now China is being the second biggest market. It will be the first biggest market, but India will follow that as well at some point in time. Not there yet, but at some point in time, they will be also the second market. So the, um, and then US is third or Europe, if you want, whole EU is uh, third. And there's a lot of dynamics going on here. And Dubai is at the center of that uh, between West and east and that's just very interesting it's the largest not not many people know it it's the largest international airport already it's not that large of a country it's like eight million inhabitants of which 80 percent is expat interestingly enough but um uh but it's the largest international airport it's a great hub between europe and asia pacific but also of course to access middle eastern markets as well so um here's where the dynamics in the future come from it's a very entrepreneurial region. Uh, I like it very much. The weather is also uh, nice as well. I'm on the beach. I live on the beach here. So uh, I, I love it. Um, I'm very happy uh, that I uh, did this for me a big step. Um, but it also will help me to be more focused on the growth markets in the future. Wow, perfect. So uh, th thank you for that. And, and obviously the, the, the beach part is, is interesting, but I think the, the other part you mentioned on uh, on opportunities, I think that's what really makes a difference, right? So thanks, Jan Kate. I mean, we, I think we talked about many things, but if, if I would take some highlights of our conversation, um, I think one of the things you mentioned is that great companies are, are built in a crisis, right? I think ISM and all the companies that you've been involved with have gone through crisis and have gotten stronger. So I think that's for all the entrepreneurs out there. I think that's a, a promising insight. Uh, you talked a lot about keeping the eye on the customer, really understanding, you know, whether it's for corporate or, or working with your other customers, making sure you really understand and, and build those relationships. And finally, I think that's, I think also looking forward, uh, your point on, you know, why you moved to Dubai. And uh, the future 20 years will be in MENA and Asia Pacific. So I think that's an invite to all the entrepreneurs uh, that we support from Upra to them to figure out how you can step into those markets uh, rather sooner uh, than later and perhaps even set up an office next to you in the sun, uh, sun uh, there. Um, Thank you very much, uh, Young Case, for making the time available. Um, uh, thanks for this. We really invite you, whenever you're back in Rotterdam, to, uh, to interact with our community uh, again, if we have the opportunity. Um, but for now, thank you very much uh, for joining us. Okay, well, thank you. It was uh, my pleasure. And all the best to all the entrepreneurs also in the uh, session. And thank you for hosting it. Keep Great. it up. Thank, thank you very yeah. much. And to, thank you for the participants. Thank you for Lisette for, uh, for helping us out here. And 
Uh, for those of you, don't forget to go to Opera Rotterdam or subscribe to the newsletter. Um, my name is Lars Krama. On behalf of Opera Rotterdam, see you at the next Ask Me Anything. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>